Welcome to Grumos Course Creators Podcast, where I deconstruct world-class online instructors to extract the tactics, tools, and systems they use to create and sell their online courses. If you want to learn what it takes to stop trading hours for dollars and start generating income by sharing your expertise online, this show is for you. Today, I'm interviewing fellow course creator Phil Ebiner. Before he started teaching five years ago, he had a $100,000 debt in student loans. Teaching online completely changed his life. Today, with over $1 million in course sales and close to a whopping half a million students, Phil is one of the most prolific and successful online teachers ever. His main focus is photography, video editing, and course creation, but he has published course on productivity, digital marketing, and even Pokemon Go. Phil embodies the profile of the ultimate self-made online teacher. In this interview, you'll find out how he got started, how he produces his courses, his thoughts on pricing, his best marketing strategies, how teaching online has changed his life, and much more. Are you ready? Let's get started. Hello, everybody. My name is Miguel Hernandez founder of Grumo.com, online instructor, and today we have Phil Eviner with us. Phil Eviner uh, is uh, one of the top online instructors on Udemy. Now he teaches on his own, on Teachable. I got a bunch of questions for Phil Eviner because he has so much experience, he's so prolific, and he's doing so much stuff that anybody that wants to learn about online course creation has to check out his uh, his stuff. So uh, let's just get to the business. Uh, how are you doing, Phil? I'm doing great. It's another wonderful day here in Southern California. I was uh, recording some new courses earlier and we were joking about how like you can see like the top. I, I put on a hat because my hair was a little messy, but uh, <laughs> from waist below, you know, it's like PJ time right now. <laughs> That's the life of the online instructor. I totally relate to that. I've done so many uh, like business calls where I was wearing just my underwear and people didn't know <laughs> yeah. about it. It was <laughs> the beautiful thing about working from home. Or so living the life. <laughs> yeah. So let's dive into it. How did you get started teaching online? Man, it's a pretty crazy story, but I started back in 2012. That was when I first launched my very first online course. And I was looking for a way to build another I guess called stream of income. I didn't really know all the terms back then, but I was working full time for a college doing video in their media department. And I was always trying to do stuff on the side, not just because it was interesting, but because I was a hundred thousand dollars in debt because of student loans. And I was living on my own because I didn't want to live with my parents. And I just felt like I wasn't making any progress. And so I started a side wedding videography business. I was doing freelance editing. But then I discovered or heard about Pat Flynn and this whole passive income idea. And I was trying to think, how can I do something like that? So I started with this idea of writing an ebook. And it was going to be called The Diary of a Film Student because I had kind of journaled a little bit during film school. And I thought I'd put that together as an ebook and sell it. But I, I think it was like during that time that I started hearing about online courses while I was writing this book because I was working at this college building online content for them as well. And I heard about Udemy and it was like this place where anyone could teach an online course. I thought that was amazing. It was like really kind of scrappy back then. The website was really different, really small. But and I think your class was on there. So you were there like before for me. So yours was one of the classes I saw. And I think I saw like, like everyone sees like the number of students and the cost of the course. And I thought this is insane. <laughs> so I just put together a course knowing on the topic that I knew best, which was video editing. And I put it up there in October of 2012. And it started selling a little bit just because it was on the site and you could easily make a little bit of money from having a course on Udemy at that time. And I got addicted and I just have been creating courses ever since. Uh, I know. Well, so what are the the, the numbers now in terms of students uh, across all platforms? Oh, across all platforms, probably over 500,000 at this point. 
Um, over 400,000 on, on Udemy. Now these aren't all, uh, you know, everyone's eyes widen at this moment, but these aren't all paid students. I, there's a lot of students who are either in my free courses of course, yeah, yeah. or got in t- through a free coupon, but, um, combining Skillshare, um, Udemy and all the other platforms, probably over 500,000. And that doesn't take into account the people who listen to my YouTube videos or watch my YouTube of videos course, or, yeah visit my site. Nowadays, I'm getting about uh, 40,000 people visiting my site a month, which is something I need to work on because that's a good amount of traffic. I'm not converting the best as I could, but I'm starting to. And then with YouTube, I'm getting about um, about a million minutes watched per month. Okay. That's so. that's really good numbers. Now, uh, it's a good thing that you mentioned the that not all the students are paid and because when people see these huge numbers on on Udemy uh it's it's very hard to know what that actually means in terms of revenue for the for the instructor in your case what would what percentage of free versus paid would you say is in is in your case i'd say probably about maybe 25% have paid for a course on yeah. Udemy i would say about um I mean, diving into the number, I could dive into the actual numbers on Udemy. I'm, I've passed the 750,000 mark yeah. in terms of personal revenue. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I'm, I'm getting close to that seven figure mark. Um, and typically, I guess the average amount that I make per sale on Udemy nowadays is close to, you know, around $5 because I'm doing a lot of co, co instructing. Yep. The average yeah. sale course on, um, Udemy is, between 10 and $15. And so when I'm splitting payments, I end up making, you know, about four to $5 per course sale on Udemy. But of course that adds up when I have a lot of classes. How has your life changed as a result of selling so many online courses? It's changed a lot, but I guess not that much in some senses. Like it's changed a lot because I, the first thing I did was I paid off all my student loans. Um, I'm pretty frugal. I mean, I guess I, I'm frugal in a lot of ways. Like I don't travel, I don't go out and party. I don't do a lot of stuff, um, like that all the time. I, I eat at home all the time. Um, I work from home in my office, but I am very fortunate to be able to do some amazing things. Like my wife and I bought a house in Southern California, which is extremely expensive. And of course we have a mortgage, but we were able to put a lot down and we're paying it off early. So we're, you know, if we're, we're on track to pay it off off pretty, um, early. So that's pretty amazing. I have done a little bit of traveling with that and just like it's afforded me the flexibility to not worry about when my next paycheck is going to come. Like my wife and I, we moved up to San Francisco for a while because she was going, getting her master's degree and I was able to move up there and find an apartment and start, you know, finding jobs yeah. without having to worry about, I didn't, I could move up there before I had a job without really worrying. And then same when we moved back down to Southern California, this was actually in 2015. And my wife and I decided that, okay, it's okay that I do this full time now. That's when I left my last full time job. And, and yeah, I didn't have to look for a job like coming down here. So it's, we're in a very fortunate position. Um, you know, money, doesn't necessarily buy happiness, but yeah. it, it definitely decreases a lot of stress. I know you started teaching on marketplaces, but uh, over the last year, like myself and many other instructors, you started to teach also on, on outside of the marketplaces on your own platform. Uh, in your case, it's Teachable. In my case, it's Thinkific. Those are like the two main self-hosting platforms. Now, what is your split on revenue between self-hosted and marketplaces right now? So right now I'm probably making like maybe 10% of what I make on the marketplace with my own site. Yeah. Um, so maybe between 10 and 20%, which isn't that much when you think about it in terms of percentage. But yeah. when I'm thinking about like my typical month, I'm making around 30 or $40,000 right now on yeah. Udemy and the other marketplaces, you know, I, it could be a, a full-time income from my self-hosted site. And that's like been a huge, uh, change that I've, we're always trying to figure out how self-hosting can work and coming from Udemy, I think it was a little bit harder than yeah. if I had just started with self-hosting. And so, I don't know, we can dive into that more, but yeah, that's kind of like the percentage right now. Yeah, you know, that is good. Now, so 
let's just dive a little bit deeper. Then we're going to go into your actual process of creating courses because I like to get into the nuts and balls on, on how every instructor actually goes about creating online courses. But in terms of uh, what is your opinion ver uh, of marketplace places versus uh, self-hosting, the pros and cons in your in your opinion? Yeah, well, I came and come from starting on Udemy. So I kind of am invested in the marketplace approach and I owe everything to the marketplace and I owe everything where I am to having started on Udemy. So I still think it's a really great place to start if you don't have an audience and you just kind of want to test it out on your own. I think the main differences are that with a marketplace, there's thousands, if not millions of students on those marketplaces already interested in online courses. So it's like that much easier to sell them a course versus if you have your own website and you have a course, not only do you have to bring the, that traffic to you, but you have to convince them that a course is the right thing for them, which it's hard to do, especially if you're trying to sell it for a higher price point, which most people self-hosting are trying to sell their courses for a higher price point. So I think that like that's the main difference is like you have to have your own audience or build your own audience if you're self-hosting. Um, it's of course you want to be building your brand and your audience if you're doing the marketplace approach as well. But I do think it's a little bit easier with the marketplace. Um, you know, talking about like sales funnels, yeah. email funnels, getting that traffic from the start. It's just a lot harder to to self-host. And also, I think just with in terms of pricing your courses, um, it's, that's where I kind of struggled because I came from Udemy where we're charging, even though our list price is maybe $200, we're charging 10 to $20 for a course. Initially, I had those same courses on my own site with the list price at $200, but I wasn't making any sales because I, you know, no one's going to buy that without me pushing them through an entire funnel and really convincing them to purchase it. Once I decreased my prices on my own site, I started making more sales. And then the current thing that I'm doing, which has really clarified how I approach this is that on my own site, what I really push is my membership model, which you can join my membership site and it's $9 a month, similar to what Skillshare used to be. And you get access to all of my courses for $9 a month. So it's kind of a no brainer for a lot of people who are interested in courses. It's super cheap. It's a price point where they don't have to think twice. A lot of people tell me I'm crazy for charging so low, yeah. but it's not that hard for me to, to make that sale compared to trying to sell my membership site for even like $29 or the individual courses for a couple hundred dollars. I have also done a couple of more premium products and premium courses yes. where I'm selling for like $500, $400 and those have worked, but it just takes a lot more effort to, to have a, a real funnel and yes. find that traffic. Yeah, it is tricky. It's tricky, but at least, you know, if you have a lot of courses and you become really good at, at, at getting people to convert at even that lower price, uh, the, the recurring revenue is something that is unbeatable, I think. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I have a pretty good, um, you know, return or refund rate, I guess. Not that many people are refunding. Um, it usually takes a few months or, or longer for people to refund or to cancel their membership. So once I get someone in that membership, they tend to stay quite a while. So yeah, it is that, that magic of the membership site. I have almost 200 people in my membership yes. site right now. So, you know, that's paying $9 a month. That's starting to be come sort of regular income that I can count on every month yeah, after month. That's great. That is the best type of income. Yeah. So if the lifetime lifetime value of your customer is they stay in an average of six months to uh, to 12 months, then it's like, uh, you know, a hundred bucks or even more per per student that joins your membership. That is great. That is already 10 times more than you usually were to capture if they just buy one Udemy course. So that, that mm -hmm. in itself yeah. makes it so much worth it. Uh, so now let's get into course creation, because obviously you've mastered the art of creating courses, not only many of them, but at a very high quality. And I just ran a 12 week uh, course creation challenge. Plus one of my top course on Udemy still is how to create an online course is the original course, which I kind of updated over the years. And 
I see people struggling so much with the technical aspects. Well, I, with all the aspects, but people get stuck with it so much. I have students that have been working on a course for two years, two years fail, uh, and they haven't gone past the first or second lecture. Obviously, this is a big issue for so many people. So I'm sure that my audience and is very interested in knowing what is your process. So let's start with how do you come up with ideas for your courses? So at this point, I, my business goal, so my brand, my main brand is video school online. And at first that started as, okay, it's a place where you learn how to make videos, but then I kind of morphed it into, okay, it's where you learn. It's an online school with videos. And so I teach video production, video editing, photography, design courses. So they all kind of interconnect. And so at this point, I've taught so many courses that I'm, I'm really looking for those big flagship courses on individual applications. So if you, if there's any photo editing app, if there's any video editing app, I want to have a course on that. And so for a while I was teaching those courses myself for all the things that I knew, like Adobe After Effects, Adobe Premiere Pro, Adobe Photoshop, um, but the ScreenFlow. But then nowadays, since I'm not an expert in all those things, I'm starting to partner with experts who do know those other apps. And so we create those classes together. And that's what I found to be the best way to increase your income is to focus on those big flagship beginner courses. Uh, that's just where the, the you're going to get the most students, the beginner courses. Um, you may be able to charge more, especially if you're doing your self-hosting courses by doing more advanced courses. But the largest audience are beginners. So so focus on those big beginner courses. I do um, some surveying of my students. And so uh, like recently, I sent a survey to all my photography students and I had a list of all my topics from landscape photography to portrait photography to different photo editing apps. And so that was a good way to find what topics were people interested in. Um, of course, that only works once you start building an audience of your own. Yeah. But but when I started, it was kind of just like, hey, this is a topic that I know. Let's see. I, I wasn't doing a lot of validation. I was just like, hey, I can I brewed a brewed some beer last week and let's teach a course on how to brew beer. <laughs> uh, yeah, I've and seen <laughs> courses on Pokemon Go and what else they like drone photography. Like you you teach anything that like you learn something and next next day there's a course by Phil Evinger on that topic. Yeah. I mean there's <laughs> and there's an argument for and against that. I, I see some people who, who are like, oh you have to be an expert. You have to, you know, have yeah. a degree in this topic to teach it. And then they'll say, oh, these people who are just teaching a lot of courses are just regurgitating information. Yeah. But I say like, hey, what's the problem with regurgitating information if I could teach it in a better way and more clear way than people having to search across blog articles and YouTube to do it? Um, I don't think it's a problem if I'm I, I don't necessarily I don't really learn and learn just to teach, but there are some things that I'm not, you know, a complete expert in yeah. that I have taught and I just find the information and figure out how to explain it in a better way. I think that provides a lot of value in itself. I have an argument that I use uh, when people complain about that. And is that, well, let's say that you yourself as a course creator spend a hundred hours researching that and you can explain it in one or two hours. And if you, if I was to do that same research, it would take me a hundred hours to get to your level. Well, you just saved me 98 hours. How much of time and money is worth that to me? Right. Mm -hmm. So, and mm -hmm. you can keep repeating that loop for any other subject. I can do some research. I package. I'm really good at package, package. I put a price and I'm saving you the time and effort to go on yourself and find all the resources. So uh, even if it, you're not an expert, like you haven't been 25 years doing that, it, you still can provide a lot of value in one or two hours of content. Now mm -hmm. talking about the, you're talking about beginners courses, uh, being the ones that have the, the most uh, traction. Uh, but I notice a lot of your courses are very, very long. So sometimes they're 20 hours. I don't know if I've seen one with like 43 hours, which is way beyond the average on Udemy. Is there an advantage of having very long courses where, uh, an instructor would be afraid that maybe most people don't end up taking the entire course because it's too much information. But when it comes to, when it comes down to sales, does it help to have a longer course? course? I definitely think so, especially on the Udemy marketplace, because it's one of that those deciding factors 
when you search for a topic, the students see the course image, they see the course title, they see the reviews, and then they see the length of the course. And so if all other things are equal, but the length of the course, one is five hours and one is 20 hours, which one is the student most likely going to pick? Even though it might be better to learn the topic in five hours if the whole thing is taught in that amount of time, they're most likely going to pick that longer course. And it just seems that Udemy tends to, I don't know if it's like the chicken before comes before the egg or not, but it seems like Udemy does promote those courses and like having those longer courses better. They just end up becoming the more best selling courses. So I don't think that you should like just pad your course with a bunch of random lectures. I always say that, you know, each individual lecture should only be the amount of time it takes to teach the subject. Uh, you don't want to like, just be rambling and you also don't want it to be too short and not really fully explaining. Um, but if there are ways to just add content, case studies, extra you know, bonus lectures to increase that length of the course, I think that does give you a little bit of an edge over the competition. When I look at, a, if I'm coming up with a new course and I'm looking at you know, what's already on the market, I always see, okay, how long is that course? How can we make it better and longer? Like recently I put out a digital marketing class and the best selling digital marketing class had like 19 hours. And so when I was thinking about this course, I was like, holy cow, how are we going to make it longer than 19 hours? But that was kind of our goal. And we came out with a course that initially was 24 hours when we, we launched it. And we've continued to add content to it. So now I think it does have like 29 hours of content. Yeah, I, I saw that course. And that's the one you partnered with Diego Davila, right? Yep. And yep. I, I think that was very smart. And it's also a good strategy for other instructors that are listening is that if you are unable to create a course that is 20 hours long, which is going to take you a long time if you don't have a lot of experience, you can also partner with somebody that can help you create a lot of the content. So you can have another uh, another co-instructor, sometimes three or even four co-instructors. So the perceived value of that course is a lot higher than a similar course because you're getting a lot more content from different experts. It's like a bundle. It's like you're getting a bundle deal with for the same price. So it becomes a no-brainer for somebody that's doing a comparison. So that's a that's a great idea. Uh, now, let's talk about your process of recording courses because you've obviously nailed make this into a science. So wh what is your typical process and how long it usually takes to create one of your courses? Yeah, it usually depends on the style of course. I'd say most of my courses are screencast based because I'm teaching some sort of computer application. And so those are pretty, um, if I'm pretty efficient at creating those, um, I'm, I usually don't record video for all of my screencasts. I've, I've done some video with screencasts and some without. And usually I find that when I have like my little video in the corner, I'm just like looking at the grant, the keyboard, and it's just not that beneficial for the students to see my face. And so at the end of the day, if I'm doing a screencast video now, I just record the screen. Don't even worry about the video and it makes it 10 times easier. I use ScreenFlow. I'm using a Mac. And so that is the first thing that you should invest in if you're an online teacher. Uh, ScreenFlow is great for Mac users. Camtasia is great for Mac or PC users. But it just gives you the ability to record your audio, your screen, and your webcam if you want all at once. It's automatically synced and ready to start editing as, as, as soon as you stop recording. And it just has all sorts of features to make it super quick to add titles, to add annotations, to, to edit your video. And so instead of trying to cobble together either free programs or using all kinds of different apps and recording tools, my advice if you're starting out is just invest $100 into something like ScreenFlow because it's going to make everything a lot more efficient. I've upgraded other types of equipment along the way. Like right now I'm using my Heil PR40 microphone, which is a nice podcasting mic yes. that I use for my courses. Um, but this is a few hundred dollars. So starting out, I used the Blue Snowball, which was another great investment because it was a great USB microphone that meant I didn't need to record separately and then import and then sync. It was automatic when recording with ScreenFlow. Uh, I think the other thing that makes me efficient, at least in my office right now, is that 
this is all set up all the time. So my, my mic, it's, you know, connected to my desk with this boom arm. I have two just paper lantern lights. If I do want to record audio or video really quickly, my webcams already uh, always set up. And so I'm just ready to get going as soon as I want. My backdrop is usually kind of what this looks like with, uh, if people are just listening to this, you just see, you know, some photos and, pictures and my typewriter and a globe. I try to keep it kind of neat in my background. And I use this real environment because it, I feel like it adds a little bit of personality to my videos. It helps people know who I am. Sometimes I use like a paper backdrop or just a plain backdrop uh, for different setups. But for just my simple screencast videos, everything's kind of ready to go. Yeah, no, I, I really like that. The fact that you have a dedicated space for recording, so you don't have to keep rearranging things. It saves you a lot of time. Also, in when you're talking about equipment, I totally agree that invest, investing in, in, in better tools and equipment is actually uh, a better idea than trying to uh, struggle working with software that doesn't do what you need. In the long term, uh, if you really value your time, it's going to save you a lot of time and it's going to make your life a lot easier. Another thing I also recommend and I found a lot of people to struggle with is that if they don't have a computer that is relatively new, when they're working with video, it can become very time consuming and frustrating to edit and encode video. And mm. sometimes people, oh, my, my computer is too slow uh, or even having a fast Internet connection can make a huge difference because we are working with very large files that take quite a bit of time to encode even in a fast computer. So really, if you want to do this seriously, uh, invest in money and it doesn't have to be outrageous, like less than a thousand dollars between the computer mm -hmm. and and, you know, a good microphone and a, and a webcam. Uh, I think you can this going to make a huge difference. Now, yeah, yeah, I was just going to follow up on that. Like we're talking about all this equipment, though. I want people to remember, though, that both of us, we started, you know, kind of <laughs> bare bones. I started recording my courses and I didn't even have Internet. So people complaining about slow Internet. I didn't even have Internet at my apartment. What I would do was I would record my videos. I would get to work early so that I could upload my content online before the workday started. And so, um, you know, that's where I <laughs> have come from. So I feel your pain when, yeah. you know, people are talking about slow internet or stuff like that. <laughs> I know. Well, if you really want to, like, that's, if you have to drive, you'll figure out a way. And obviously you're very self-motivated. Also, when I started teaching, I have no idea about to teach. I was like, I saw somebody that made a course and made a lot of money. I'm like, I'm just going to record myself and be a teach and see what happens. And it turned out to be successful. I think the level uh, of quality is Expected these days is maybe higher than it was maybe seven or six years ago because people mm -hmm. are seeing so many courses. So it, it helps you differentiate you and your brand if it's uh, it's neat and you put the effort in making things uh, look great. But really, what my, uh, when they've done studies about you know analyzing engagement on millions of uh, of lectures. Uh, People don't re didn't really care mu much about the production quality, you know, whether they spend so mm -hmm. much money on the studio or the audio. It really matters is, is two things is that the, the instructor is engaging, that you can see and understand and hear what the person is saying and that the content is uh, put in a way that is it's easy to understand. That's what really mm -hmm. matters. So mm -hmm. for that, you don't need to spend thousands of dollars. You can start with even your phone if you wanted to. Right. So uh, that's something to keep in mind. Uh, all right, let's move on. Uh, so overall, how long it takes you to create one course from the moment that you select the idea to the moment that you publish it? See, that again depends on the course. So for example, I just finished a an After Effects course, a complete sort of update, 10 hour course. And that took me about, it's hard to say because I'm always jumping around from doing stuff. But if I put it, if I was sitting down, you know, eight hours a day, uh, it probably took me about two weeks to do like maybe 80 hours of, of work to put that course together. Yeah. Um, but that was just a screencast course. Yeah. And it was a long screencast course, though. But then and I kind of was uh, referenced to this with in terms of my course um, equipment. If I'm not doing a screencast course, sometimes I, I really up the production value and I, I got professional cameras. We're shooting live video. We're shooting B-roll. We're shooting all kinds of content that I have to edit together. And so some classes like that 
whether it's like my video production boot camp or my photography masterclass, those took took months to create. Um, but also, on the other hand, like right now, I'm creating a new Mac Photos editing class, which is just a you know three or four hour class on how to edit with the Mac Photos app. And this is probably going to take me just um, maybe a few days to actually record the entire class and okay. edit it. So, uh, like this, I mean, that is already a lot faster than most people. Like I said, people are starting out. Sometimes they take months. You're saying you did that. Oh, this is if you were to work eight hours straight, it would have taken you two, uh, two weeks to do an eight hour course, right? So that's about a ratio of one eight hours of work per one hour of, of content, which also gives you an idea of that to create that one hour of content. It's, uh, it's not just that you record and it's one to one. It, it takes you, yeah. you have to prepare the content. You have to do several takes. You have to edit the content. You have to edit it, upload it, add the descriptions, the titles, make sure everything works. So there is, there is a lot more than just recording that most people don't realize that is part of the course creation. Still, that is quite fast. And it seems that you're working on more than one course at a time. Is that true? Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Like it depends on the, the month or the week, but sometimes I'm pre-producing a bunch of courses. So I'm working on outlines for a lot of courses. I, the least, my least favorite thing that I have to do is write the sales copy and, and build out the course on Udemy or the different platforms. And so that's actually what I do first. Before I even start recording, I will actually write out the sales copy and I'll tweak it down later if I add content or change the course a little bit. But that's all done, which makes it so easy for me to just jump into recording and editing. And then once I start editing, I'm uploading content and you know, you see that content starting to upload, you see the course being built out and that just is, is exciting. Uh, but yeah, always working on something different. Like right now I'm recording this Mac photos course. I just launched another affinity photo, photo editing course. I'm co-instructing an InDesign course. And so there's <laughs> another person who's like finishing recording that. So I'm doing all of it at the same time. And that's just the course creation process, which is probably only 25% of my time now because most of my time is student responding to student questions and building my brand outside of the courses with YouTube content, website content, and all that kind of stuff too. Yeah, so that's what I was going to ask you. Uh, one of the things that I noticed the moment that I try to sell courses on my own and I've told my students they have to be ready to to uh, tackle this is the fact that if 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 you go on your own, a big chunk of your time is going to be building your brand, doing marketing as opposed to course creation. So you may enjoy really teaching a lot, but if you want to make a business out of it, you're going to have to really get good at marketing and understand that that's going to take a big chunk of your time, sometimes even the majority of your time. And or if you if you can, you you, you should outsource some of it if you just want to focus 100 percent on course creation. In your case, what would be the ratio between course creation versus marketing efforts? So probably, I mean, probably like 50 50. Um, and if I count like just YouTube videos and tutorials and writing blog article tutorials as marketing, maybe even more on the marketing side, uh, at least nowadays. Of course, it, it depends on the week, but I, I feel like so much of my time is spent, you know, updating my website, uploading stuff to YouTube. And this is stuff that I could probably hire someone uh, to outsource and do. Um, but speaking of that, I have done a little bit of outsourcing. Like I have an, a TA who I hired who's spending 10 hours a week answering student questions on Udemy for me. Uh, I have hired a couple writers recently to write blog content for me. Oh, nice. And that is really exciting because they're writing right now as we're recording this this episode. And the, the key with that was finding people who are experts in the topic and paying them enough. And I, I learned that from you with, you know, hiring people for your own company, you got to pay them the right amount. Yes. So they're dedicated and invested in doing a good job. But I think when I was starting, I did try to hire someone to write articles, but I just looked on Upwork and hired like a VA and the content was just, it was just like so bad. It was like one of those articles that you read when you like, 
search for something in Google, you click on the article and it has like five lines and you're like, Oh, that, you know, this is bad. Yeah. And so, and so this time I still found them on Upwork actually, but okay. instead of these are people writing photography art articles for me, instead of just finding regular people who write just writers, I found photographers who also have written in the past. And so I, I hired them for test articles to see how they did. And, and then I, I hired them each to do a batch of 10 articles for me. So that that's been exciting right now because with my website, my goal is to have, you know, if there's a question about photography for beginners, I want to answer it with a blog article and I just don't have the time or haven't had the time to do all of that myself. And so right now I'm going to have, you know, a batch of 20 articles that I can link to each other because they're all related. And that's just consistent content that I could put out for the next few months. That's that's very smart. That's a big lesson for anybody that wants to grow beyond themselves is to learn to to outsource. In fact, if you, you I don't think you really have a business until you start delegating some of tasks to other people, because then it is you doing everything right. So one of the first things I learned as soon as my animation studio became busy after I read a book like the E Myth Revisited was that you have to delegate and that puts you in a different uh, situation because as a course creator, that doesn't mean that you are great at hiring people, but you need to learn what it takes to uh, find the right people, attract them and retain them. And, and one of the, uh, the strategies definitely uh, be, you know, uh, communicating with them often, give them clear instruction, motivating them, and of course, paying them as, as, as much as they deserve and on time. And, and then you'll be able to retain these, these great, uh, these great uh, people that are helping you grow their business. So yeah. good for you that you're already started to do that because that's going to make your life a lot easier. Now, in terms of how you, do you pay them by the hour? Do you pay them by the project? How do you go about that? Uh, for the person who's answering questions, he on my Udemy students, um, he is getting paid by the hour. So he it's it's awesome because he's a college student in Texas. So I think now I'm paying him about 14 bucks an hour. I started paying him like $10 an hour and he's increased it as, you know, he's become more valuable. But to me, that's a really good price yeah. uh, to pay. But I also think for him, it's a pretty good price to, to earn as a college student. Um, I'd probably, I hope he doesn't listen to this. He might listen to <laughs> this, but I'd probably pay him more. <laughs> uh, he's asked me to increase his rate and, um, you know, as frugal as I am and I'm like, Oh, I don't want to, you know, I like paying you $11 an hour. Yeah. It's definitely worth it for me to have the quality. You know, I could hire anybody for $7 oh, or yeah. $5 from, you know, another country who, and maybe they do an amazing job, yeah. but I think, um, right now he's totally worth it. And then for the articles I'm paying per article, uh, between 50 to a hundred dollars per article. Um, again, something that I might, inc I would probably increase, um, but, uh, they're doing a pretty good job for, for that price right now. That's, that's great. Are you, what are other things are you thinking to outsource? Oh, uh, well, I have thought about outsourcing editing in the past and I, I actually have experimented with that. And I think that's probably the first thing that a lot of people would like to outsource because it's the most time consuming part of course creation. But personally, I, I'm an editor. This is my background. Yeah, so of course. I find that I'm super efficient at it. I, even the guy who I hired to do it, he did an amazing job, but I was finding that it took him about three times as long as I would to, to, um, do the edit. And I was paying him like $25 an hour, which, um, you know, was worth it to me. But then when I thought, I would do it three times faster. It's kind of like $75 an hour that I'm losing by hiring him. And I enjoy the editing part. You know, for me, I like, I, I'm sticking with editing. Um, but I think ultimately I would love to outsource just more of like the, the business work and the updating of the website. Like, like just the, like the going onto WordPress to update my plugins or, or, um, uh, answering some emails that are repetitive, having more of like an actual assistant that does that yeah. is kind of like the next step for me. Do you, when you train them, do you have some kind of, cause I do, I do this at Groomer Media, maybe I mentioned it to you. Mm -hmm. uh, once you start growing your company, it's neat, important to have some kind of like operations manual or something like that, where you're mm -hmm. like, this is how we do things here, right? Are you keeping track of your like uh, uh, operating procedures in, in somewhere? 
Well, what I've done so far with like my TA that answers questions, I, I recorded a bunch of videos to show them how it works. Nice. And so that's kind of cool, but I haven't like delved into like the more day-to-day -day operations of the business yet, just cause I haven't tried to hire someone yeah. to help me with that yet. Um, but it's definitely like a good idea. And another idea I've had in the past is as video school online grows, how can I bring someone else to really be like a part of the brand who, who maybe is like a face of the brand as well. Who's doing tutorials with me. Who's like uh, an expert in some topic, like maybe photography or whatever. And I want him to do be like the photography expert on my YouTube channel, on my website. But that's like something I haven't really thought about. Um, but that's like a whole different ball game where I'm really partnering with someone to, to build the brand. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's a good idea that, that it starts becoming more of an organization that doesn't depend so solely on you and your brand and you being available and you can distribute tasks. And it's a little mm -hmm. bit like maybe like the Linda model where mm -hmm. it, you have all these people that are creating content, but they belong also to the organization, uh, but mm -hmm. that's at a, a scale that you can manage. As I said, it's a good idea. Uh, so, this is a question I think is crucial and everybody wants to know the answer to because as uh, any business owner or uh, which a course creator is, uh, the importance of growing the email list, that email list, that, that group of people that uh, you're building a relationship with and that's where they say your money is on the email list. What are you doing that is working the best to grow your email list? Uh, creating free courses and using Teachable to give out those free courses and hooking Teachable up with ConvertKit. Now, Teachable or Thinkific, they probably connect with all sorts of email um, service providers, but yes. I use ConvertKit because it's all automated. So if anyone signs up for my whatever court Photoshop for beginners course, uh, they automatically get added to my email list. I can add them automatically to some sort of email sequence. And so that is just, that's just been the best I'm getting, you know, I have kind of tweaked things. I've trashed a lot of my old subscribers cause they weren't, <laughs> weren't doing anything for me. Yeah. Um, and so recently I updated a lot and now I'm getting maybe between 50 to a hundred subscribers a week, um, with those free courses on, nice. on, on Teachable. I, I also have a, an opt-in on the homepage of my website, Video School Online, um, but I don't have like a traditional lead magnet right now in okay. terms of like, here's my five tip PDF or yes. here's a free 30 page ebook. I've done that in the past, but one of the issues that I've had is how do I serve, uh, how do I come up with a lead magnet that serves my audience best when I have an audience that comes from all over the place, photographers, video editors, business creators. Like for a while I was, I had a lead magnet that was geared towards online course creators that was on the homepage of videoschoolonline.com, which at the time video school online and my whole online course creating teaching program, it was all one. So it was very messy. Yeah. And I realized I wasn't serving my audience the right way because half my email list was interested in teaching online. Half were like interested in learning after effects. And so now I've split the two brands. So I just have video school online as like the creative place. And then online course masters.com is my online teaching space. And so both the best lead magnet right now are just like the free courses though. Nice. So that that's your lead magnet. Now, how, what is your main source of traffic to that lead magnet? Mm, yeah. Um, just, blog articles and YouTube videos. Um, I've been blogging for, you know, five years now since 2012 or maybe 2013. I, I quickly realized after teaching online, my first online course that I needed my own home base. And so I've been blogging pretty consistently. And so I have some pretty highly ranked articles for like very niche topics. Yes. And so if you search like what's the difference between Adobe Premiere Pro and After Effects and Google, then my article might be the first one or, or green screen editing and After Effects mine's, might be one of the first articles. And so I've, um, yeah, just have those articles that are driving a lot of traffic. And then my YouTube channel, just tutorials and using YouTube cards and the YouTube description to send people back to my, my site. Uh, I, I do for, did forget to mention one of 
my other best sort of the start of my sales funnel, but also a lead magnet, I guess, is I'm offering a free seven day trial to my membership site. That's a good one. Which, which is basically my teachable site. It's a teachable bundle that I have a me- membership plan for. Um, but I'm using Thrivecart, which is a separate app plugin to be able to do that. And what that allows me to do is it puts a buy button or a free trial button on my website where people can click and sign up for my teachable course, which is the free trial, all from the homepage of my website rather than sending sending them to the sales page on Teachable. It's all taking place on the homepage of Video School Online. So there's less of a barrier to entry. Um, So I'm getting a lot of people signing up for that free trial and that converts to a, the paid trial automatically. So people do actually have to put in their credit card information to get that free trial. But yes. that has really increased the number of people signing up for my membership site in the past couple of months. Yeah, because you lower the friction. Now, when people buy from your website it, and they pay you, does the Thrive card create an autom- automatically an account on Teachable? Yeah, so it's connected. Nice. So. People, yeah, it's all can integrated. So they're automatically enrolled in the course and it could be a membership course. It could be an individual course. Yeah. And that's the cool thing is that you have, um, you can put up, build your own sales pages on your own site if you don't want to use the teachable sales page. Uh, and people can easily buy it right there from your own site. And Thrivecart gives you a lot more data on the customers in your membership site than Teachable does. Well, you could probably figure it out yourself on Teachable somehow, but Thrivecart gives you things like the the refund rate, the average, um, the like customer value. Nice. And that's what I ha- I haven't done yet, but what I'm going to do because I don't do a lot of advertising yet or stuff like that. But if I can figure out that like every customer is you know worth. $27 to me or whatever, Yeah. then I could take that information and say, okay, how much can I spend on ads to drive people to that free trial? Exactly. Knowing, knowing that, yeah, it's a lot, but knowing the conversion rate from like who takes the free trial, who continues with the paid course, and then, yeah, knowing how long they stay on, I can figure that yeah, out. That was going to be my next question if you try paid ads. Uh, but that it, in, before you do it's very important to have those numbers. So one of the questions I have here, and I think it's crucial to grow any business is really knowing your numbers, not just the amount of traffic that you get, but your conversion rates, where that traffic is coming from, which traffic converts the best, because then you know where you can double down your investment and efforts, right? So in your case, most of your traffic is inbound, right? You're doing content marketing, you're creating lots of YouTube videos, you're creating lots of articles, which is great because you don't have to pay for it. I mean, you do have to pay for it in in a sense, because it's your time or you're hiring somebody to create the content uh but it's a it's a it's a long-term strategy to keep getting traffic on a regular basis it's like the evergreen way of getting traffic the one mm-hmm. that scales the best once you figure out your funnel is uh paid advertising but uh, so what what are you doing to track conversions like do you keep track of all, all like the which channels are converting the best do you use any tools to figure out what are com- the conversion rates Mm, that's probably where I'm like the worst at. And this is why, like, if someone saw my business, they could see that I have, you know, 40,000 people visiting my website, you know, thousands of views, millions of views per, per month on my YouTube channel. Like you could be making a lot more money. Yes. And that's just because I'm not paying attention to the stats that much. I think this whole thrive cart integration is the first step for me because I can see that, like, I'm looking at the stats right now, like, there's a 9% conversion rate for people who click on the free trial button yes. and uh, actually put in their credit card information and start the free trial. And then I could all, then I could look at, you know, what, how many visitors am I getting to my homepage? So if I'm getting a thousand visitors per month, I guess I could see how many people are actually clicking on the free trial. And then with that conversion rate, again, like we said, I could, see how if I can use ads to send 10,000 visitors to my site, what price is it worth it to pay for ads? Of course, um, so, yeah. so this is kind of like the start of that. Um, I use, you know, this is probably not the right way to do it, but I, I kind of just 
see what I think is working best. And I see, okay, this topic on YouTube does well. And so I'm going to create more videos like that. And there's a lot of intangibles when it, when it comes to things like that. Like, you know, maybe this video doesn't necessarily drive a sale, but it's making a customer happier. And it's something that I can send in my email to my email list or to my Udemy students. And they, it builds that brand trust. And so the next time I launch a course, maybe they're interested in that topic a little bit more and more likely to buy the course or something like that. It's, so. it's, it's hard to measure sometimes because like you say, many customers before they buy from you, they probably interact anywhere from five to seven times with your content. And they, you don't know which content they interacted before or which one was the one that said, hey, I really I really like this guy. So obviously, the more content you have, the more they get to know you, the more they'll trust you and eventually convert. So the key is that you have to keep creating content, right? Mm-hmm. And uh this is something I've, I've done a little bit on my YouTube channel, which I need to also, in, my, in a sense, I'm like you, where I have so many topics in one channel. And I'm realizing now that it's very important to have one specific focus. And so people know what to expect as opposed to like, I'm talking about online courses, then I'm talking about demo videos, then I'm talking about my life, <laughs> and it's all over the place. And people are like, what the hell are you about? Right. Yeah. Uh, but one of the things that I, uh, like, if you grind higher for a keyword on YouTube, that, that, that specific video can do a lot. Lot of a lot of good and and what i've been doing is creating custom landing pages for specific videos right mm. so that way i know that the people that watch that video if they click on on that link on that card they're going to be taken to a to a specific landing page that talks to them after watching that video and, and i've seen com- my conversion rates the highest ones are over 40 percent of people giving mm-hmm. me the email address, not buying anything, right? Mm-hmm. So that's mm-hmm. the other thing. I don't ha- uh, how many people that give me the email address eventually convert. And on the on, on the typical stats on on the industry, they say it's about two percent of your email list ends up buying or something like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's so many things you can track, but anyways, at yeah, the end I, yeah. Another thing I was gonna say, one thing that I do do, and this is just like, um, it's not that very scientific or e- hard to do, but on my website, I use the pretty link, um, plugin. So yes, I put all my, um, and you could do this other ways too, but I have my courses page where it lists all of my courses. And instead of just including links to the Udemy courses, which, which I drive people from my course page to Udemy actually, but instead of just including the Udemy link, I use the pretty link, which allows me to more easily track all those clicks. And so I can see all the stats, which just shows me which courses are more popular on that page. And you can also use Google analytics, the in page analytics to do this. But, but I can see, Oh, like a lot of people are clicking my YouTube class compared to my other classes. And that just shows me on my audience for my website audience, what are they interested in? And same with uh, using the in page analytics, uh, which I'm using the Google Chrome extension, the page analytics. Yeah. Um, but I can see like the hot spots of my web page and I can see that on my home page I have my courses drop down which lists the categories of my courses, which are video, photography, design and business. Most people or the highest percentage one is video. So that means like most people coming to my cl- my website are interested in video production. Yes. And so that's what I should be actually doing more of there's another part of me that is like, well, there's this whole photography side. Yeah. Uh, maybe I'm not serving that audience enough and maybe I need to create more content to drive more photography people to my website because I have those courses and I could sell them, but it just depends on how you want to use those analytics. Yeah. Yeah. Well, at least I, I've been using pretty link as well. And it's, it's quite useful because like you say, it gives you an idea of what links are working the, the, the most before you send them either to a landing page or to Udemy. And from there, you can make some decisions based on, on data. I call that data driven, data driven decision making, which mm-hmm. is uh, better than emotional driven decision making. We're like, I think people like this. And you're like, how do you know? <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that's awesome. So. Yeah. That takes care of the course creation, the marketing strategies. Uh, now, in, t- in terms of uh, uh, productivity, uh, it's how do you keep yourself organized? Do you have a system where, like, a, a, either a planner or you use the Pomodoro technique, or what the what do you do in order to make sure that your days are as productive as possible? 
I think for me, it's just having a to-do list, like a task list that I always have going. And if I ever think of a, something that I need to do, or if I get an email where someone's asking me to do something, I just write that on my to-do list. And you could do this. I've done it on my whiteboard. I could do it on a piece of paper. But right now I'm using Asana.com yes. and they have an Asana app. It's a very fancy piece of equi- equipment just to have like a checklist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've used <laughs> but, it. Yeah. But that's that's pretty much what I do. I've used other stuff in the past with, you know, the fancy bubbles and you can add all kinds of information to your to-do list. But a simple to-do list, I think, is the main thing that I do. And and the other thing that I use Asana for is like article ideas, tutorial ideas, which are kind of like a to-do list, but it's just like a running list of of articles that I could write so that when I do have time to write an article, I'm not like trying to come up with the article topic. I already have it there ready to create. Uh, I, I think the hardest thing for a lot of people is getting motivated to do the work and to to actually just like do it. I think I'm very blessed in the sense that I, I'm very self-motivated. And even though I work for myself, I wake up at seven o'clock or six 30 every day and I'm working by seven 30 or eight and I work through till four or five. Um, sometimes I'm on the couch doing emails, watching game of Thrones, but, um, for the most part I'm, I'm working pretty hard and, I, I don't have a secret though to like why yeah. I'm like that or how to help people. Yes, it's just, course. you know, it's just part of how pe- how people are. And I think that's advice though. If you want to get into this, know that you're going to have to figure out some way to motivate yourself to get up in the morning and to get to work every, every day. Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that yeah. is that is the hardest thing of working on on your own, definitely, because no, you don't you don't have accountability, you don't have a boss. You have to create your own structure, and that's something I've struggled a lot. I'm a night owl. I like last yeah. night I went to sleep at I think uh, six in the morning. <laughs> I hate to say that. I really live in the night, right? So, but I as long as I get my to me, it's about finding the balance, right? So if I get um, an average of eight hours a day, and I and then I get another eight hours of solid work. And then I, I spend time with my wife and I, you know, I, we always watch a TV show when, while we're having dinner. So that's one hour, one and a half of just leisure. And then I spend between one and two hours learning at night every day. Uh, and then I, at the end of the day, I always try to have a, clearly a list of what's going to happen the next day. So in my case, my to-do list is actual, uh, I use Trello for, uh, for mm-hmm. as one side of the, 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 the task list, task list, task list, and then uh, calendar, Google calendar. To me, my motto mm-hmm. is, is if, if it's not in the calendar, it's not going to happen. And that's true because if it's not the calendar, I'll forget <laughs> yeah. how many times my wife has told me, Miguel, uh, we're supposed to be here. It's like, but it's not in the calendar. So it's, it's not true. Yeah. It's like, yes, you forgot to put it in the calendar. So what I did, I shared my calendar with her so she can put stuff on my calendar. That way I'll never forget. That's so. funny. That's what my <laughs> wife is a Google calendar fiend and she'll put everything on the calendar. And so I've, I've learned to do that. Um, but you know, this, I'm looking at my calendar. I've got We've got a schedule for, we've got, you know, here's one of the perks of me, one of my splurges. We got one of those Roombas, you know, the oh, vacuum yeah, yeah, of course, things. Yeah. So th- that's, you know, one of the perks of making a little bit of extra money. And that's on our calendar. We have the Roomba schedule that it's automatically goes on Tuesdays and Fridays. <laughs> and, so, and, so, and so I know when I go on my calendar, oh yeah, it's three o'clock, the room is scheduled. Uh, and so it's like down to that, we have everything. I've been having the Roomba schedule on your calendar. Yeah, that's 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 taking it to the next level. No, no <laughs> yeah. Something I do sometimes so I don't forget, I use Google Calendar kind of to keep a, a journal of what has happened, especially specific milestones, because then I can quickly mm. look on my Google Calendar for like um, things that happened. So for example, mm. uh, yesterday I wrote at the end of the day, like a list of all the main things that I did. Uh, uh, sometimes when I meet somebody or I have an in- interesting phone call, I go and I'll put it on the calendar just so I remember when mm. that happened, right? For example, like today, I have a reminder that this is when Steve Jobs died this very day uh, mm. in 2011, I think, right? Uh, I mean, that's just one of the things that I would randomly write on my thing, <laughs> yeah. right? Uh, so... <laughs> 
I think we're, let me just, I think I, I have a couple of questions here. Yeah, yeah, no, I of forgot, course. Where are my, my, my questions? I, I keep clicking on tabs. Uh, <laughs> so uh, what is your goal for, do you set goals? And if, it's, if you do, what is your goal for next year? And then what is your ultimate goal in business? That's a really good question. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have any goals? That's no, okay. I, I, <laughs> I actually, um, I actually sat down like a couple months ago and wrote a lot of goals, and a lot of it was just about like taking video school online and making it like way more legitimate. And I, I felt like it wasn't a recognizable brand; it was all yeah. over the place. And so I've started doing things like I kind of did a, a whole new facelift on my website. And at, at least right now, I'm happy with it. I'm one of those people that tweaks their website almost every month or so, and I want to change it. But right now, I'm happy with it. I went through, I created a new logo. Um, and so I'm trying to keep that brand consistency across everything from my YouTube thumbnails to my blog graphics to you know my titles and my videos and colors and fonts and all that stuff just to be a little bit more recognizable for people watching the video. I got my cool hat with the video school online wow, logo nice. printed out. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's like one of my big goals is just to have like a better, better brand. Part of that is also just to keep building the website. I, I pay attention to the Alexa ranking of my website and you know, it's not the best way to calculate how popular a website is, yeah. but I've seen it growing over the past, you know, since I started the website, but now we're, well, I'm looking at right now, we're like the four, 42,652 website in the US That's great. Uh, out of popularity, according to Alexa, which is really incredible. And we're 120,000 in the world. And my goal was by the end of this year to break that top 100,000. And so I got a couple more months, so we might do that. So just trying to, you know, make sure that the website's continuing to grow. Uh, one of my big projects that I'm working on right now is actually converting my garage into my office and studio. And so even though I have everything set up kind of like right now, I don't have my my actual regular camera that I use, my DSLR or my backdrop set up. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to have that all set up and ready to go. So I can just go into the studio and start recording whenever I want. Um, and so like stuff like that, I, I look at other YouTubers out there and they're so like professional. They have a schedule their their sets always the same. Yes. They have like their different shows or whatever that they're doing on YouTube. And, and that's kind of what I want to do. I want to figure out like, how can I have like a consistent, more consistency on my YouTube channel? And I think like the studio is kind of a not necessary part of that, but just like a kick in the butt to do things like that. Yeah. Um, and then in terms of revenue, I'm, I'm always just trying to increase it. Um, I always look at like the last year's revenue or compare this year's to last year's, like at the same time and like black Friday is coming up. So November is usually a big month on Udemy. And I'm always, uh, seeing how I did compared to the last year. And it always amazes me that almost every year for the past few years, I've been able to double my income from the previous Black Friday. And wow. so every year I'm like, there's no way I'm going to do it this year. <laughs> but it's happened the past few years. So I, I, you know, I'm knocking on wood, crossing my fingers. I, I, I hope to God it would be amazing if I could double this this year. Yes. Uh, I'd be happy if it, it, you know, even stayed the same as last year. Yeah. But um, that's just one of those, you know, those numbers that I pay attention to and just try to increase yeah. that revenue all, all the time. Yeah, that, that's that's good. It's like very specific milestones. Like in, in this time of the year, I usually make so much amount of money. If mm. I make the double, I know I'm on a, on a track that has been uh, consistent over the last few years. That's that's awesome. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Well, I really hope that you can make that happen. You're really on that way. I mean, your website is looking great. You have a logo. I mean, everything is falling into place. But obviously it happens because you have that uh, self, you're a self-driven individual. Mm -hmm. uh, 
then I have a couple of questions added in the last moment, but I think they're very important because at the end of the day, we're in the business of educating people, right? Mm. And uh, it's great. It's a great business if you're able to monetize it. It's also very rewarding because it's awesome being how you're changing the lives of so many people across, like sometimes in your case, probably 190 different countries. It's just amazing that amount of reach. Uh, and it, it seems that we, we both, I mean, in your case, I never was actually in, in debt because I went to a college and I paid out of myself and it was not too expensive. But one of the biggest problems in education is definitely that uh, the education system, traditional education system, people end up in debt, like insanity, like $100,000 of, of debt when you don't even have a job yet. That's insanity. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. What do you think is it's uh, it's uh, could be fixed? Like what? And I, I know it's a generic uh, question, but what do you think would be a great uh future for education what would have to change i mean going to what you were just talking about yeah. and i don't know you know i hear all this all the time because i pay attention to like financial podcasts and yeah. blogs and stuff but just learning basic finance is not something that we do as kids in school high school or, or even college and so th it that's just it's not necessarily that the education system is broken but yeah. it's just a topic that we don't teach about. And it always, um, that is one thing that I learned from a high school teacher and fr um, from my parents who weren't that good at finance at all. Yeah. Um, but pay, you know, the simple thing of like paying off your credit card every month is what you should and need to be doing. And it always amazes me how many people that just doesn't comprehend to them. Yeah. It doesn't make sense that they thought they think that, you know, your credit card is to just use and then you pay off the minimum. Yeah. And that is like the first problem with getting into deep financial doo-doo. Yeah. And so yeah. it's like they don't teach this stuff in high school, though. And so like adding just simple personal finance classes um, is something that's definitely necessary. And I, I mean, I think we're on this path of making education more accessible. And that's one of the reasons I'm so excited to teach online when I get messages from students around the world who say, your class is so amazing. Like we never had access to this kind of education before. Like no, there's no photography courses in our local town or whatever, or, you know, whatever it is. And so just making it more affordable is, is pretty exciting. Yeah, no, I think that that point, uh, being a little bit more financially aware, which it doesn't take that long. Like you could watch even you have a couple of videos on finances. Yeah. Right? Literally, it's going to take you 10 minutes to understand the fundamentals. And just yeah. I mean, it's like no brainer. Don't spend more money than you have like that. Yeah, that's not that hard to get. Right. You don't need to have like be an Einstein to figure that out. But it's a huge problem. And it's not it's yeah. not emphasized enough uh, throughout your uh, formal education, unfortunately. All yeah. right. So. Let's just go to the last couple of questions here. Uh, who are one or two online teachers that you see as role models that you think these guys are doing a great job? Oh man, that's such a hard question. <laughs> How do I pick one or two? Or, I, I mean, I, or, I think or 20, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, well, it's, I, I can't pick one or two. And the, there's two reasons for that. Yeah. One is I'm a very bad online course student. I don't actually take that many online <laughs> courses. <laughs> You're creating courses. Which is, which is amazing. Uh, and I don't know, maybe hypocritical. I don't know. I watch a lot of YouTube channels and YouTube videos. But there are so many people that I've interviewed on my podcast that have been inspiring. You know, you, of course. But yeah. there's some people recently. There's this guy, Wes Boss, who he... Spent, we, you know, we kind of talked about paid advertising a little bit. And he does some of that. But he was telling me, like... J don't focus on paid advertising, just focus more on creating free courses. Yes. And he is, he spends more time creating high quality free courses than paid courses. And one of his free courses, he's had like a hundred thousand students enroll in that free course. Yeah. And this is all on his own site, not on That's Udemy. Amazing. And so like, I'm always interviewing people like him and it's just inspiring to hear their story. And see, you know, he, he's kind of living the dream. He's got his house, uh, up in, I think he was from Canada or something, but up in the, the woods and yes. he's, he's got his little family and it's just <laughs> awesome. He's living the dream. Yeah. I, I listened to that interview. Uh, actually, this is a good point to tell our audience that Phil has an amazing podcast. 
called the is the online course masters mm-hmm. podcast. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. So, yeah. So then you can find it on uh, iTunes. And yeah. he's done already like, I don't know, 30, 40 interviews. They're all awesome with with uh, instructors, instructors, instructor, instructors like myself. And mm-hmm. Wes Buzz, I listened to that one. That was great. I, it's pretty amazing. Uh, I checked his website. The guy is a big deal, on, uh, specific, especially on coding, coding yeah. uh, boot camps. And, and he's got a lot of great free content. So it's mm-hmm. a, g- a great role model, I think, because he's engaging and both his business wise, he's very, very talented. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So any podcast you would recommend uh, on this topic as well, besides yourself, obviously? Or <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I would say that um, actually the podcasts that I listen to, I think are important, the finance ones. So I'll name a couple. One is Listen Money Matters. Yes. And then one is the mad scientist. That's like the mad scientist, but scientist for like oh, finance. Okay. Yes. Um, and those are two podcasts to listen to. And then one guy who has a website that you should listen to or read is Mr. Money Mustache. Oh, and I these are all that. related to the, the finance world. And I think it's so important, though, for people to realize that there's there's an alternative way to, to live and spend your money uh, a way where, you know, you can be more free and ha- be happier, even if you're not making that m- as much money. So I think those are important, just as important as, you know, all the other p- business podcasts like Smart Passive Income and those yeah, ones that yeah. I, I also listen to and really enjoy. But the finance ones are really important, too. OK, well, thanks so much. Uh, where people can find you? We already mentioned about but where, where people can find more about you. Yeah, if you want to see more about like my personal background and see some of the video production work that I do, you can head to my personal website, philebener.com. If you're interested in the online course teaching aspect of what I talked about, you can visit onlinecoursemasters.com. And then if you want to just see my whole world and my brand uh, and all my courses that I teach, go to videoschoolonline.com. Awesome. Well, make sure yeah, everybody listening, go and check it out. He, Phil, is a, an amazing teacher, very prolific, like I said, and uh, definitely a big role, role model, including myself, uh, to follow uh, as an online instructor. Well, thank you very much. Thanks so much, Miguel. It was a pleasure. Well, that's all for today. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to it, rate it, and share it with your friends. To learn more about me, Grumo, and the universe, just visit grumo.com. That is G-R-U-M-O.com. Thanks for listening. My name is Miguel Hernandez, and this was the Grumo Podcast.